This is CBC Here and Now. The latest on the condition of Delilah Saunders. We're cautiously optimistic that we've seen some improvements. Dr. Hagee performs a communications operation after his deputy minister angers nurses. Simply because of the job he does, I wouldn't like people to go away and think that's government policy. Government policy in this area is still being formulated. Now I'm so happy because I have a good Christmas here in, <laughs> in Newfoundland. A Filipino family back together after almost four years. After the first big storm of the season in eastern Newfoundland, the next one sets its sights on western Newfoundland and Labrador. The details are coming up. Well, Christmas came early for a family of seven from the Philippines who've been living apart for almost four years. When boy Alex Asayo came to Newfoundland, to uh, he had to leave his wife and five daughters behind until he could afford to bring them to the province. Late Friday afternoon, that reunion finally happened, and here now's Fred Hutton was there to witness the happy moment. It was a reunion almost four years in the making, but after just a few moments, it was like this family had never been apart. Boy Felix Asio left the Philippines in 2014 to come to work as a hairstylist at Chatter Salon. For Boy, nothing mattered besides getting his family back together. It's so hard because every night I talk on Skype, so, but now I'm so happy because I have a good Christmas here in, in Newfoundland. <laughs> Asio's boss, Rosemary Buckingham, said it was an exciting time leading up to the reunion. He's so anxious. Like, we're all anxious. Like, we're all nervous. He hasn't slept. Uh, every day he just walks around with a smile on his face. Like, life is, life is going to be good now for Boy and his family. All that bureaucratic red tape and mountains of paperwork behind getting six people into Canada became a distant memory as they hugged each other. Asio's youngest daughter was just three weeks old when he left home. He had only seen her one other time last Christmas. She was clinging to her father, making it difficult for the other daughters to get close. I don't have enough money back home, so I decided to come here for work. One of the biggest adjustments for the Asio girls and their mom will be getting used to the weather in St. John's. When asked what she knew about the province, Asio's wife, Rihanna, had this to say. Friendly people. What about the weather? <laughs> the weather, very cold. Asio's eldest daughter, 14-year-old Angel, was also warned about the weather, but has her sights set well beyond a chilly winter. Newfoundland is very beautiful, and there's a lot of opportunities here. And then the sliding doors opened at the airport, giving the Asios their first taste of Newfoundland weather. Not even the bone-chilling wind, though, could wipe away their smiles as they headed off to begin their new lives, together again, at last. Fred Hutton, CBC News, St. John's. Health Minister John Hagee is trying to lower the temperature on the debate over health care in this province. That's after his own deputies stoked the flames last week and the nurses' union went on the offensive. Here now is Terry Roberts reports. John Hagee, in the radio studio taking questions and comments from the public and distancing himself from his top lieutenant in the public service. Simply because of the job he does, I wouldn't like people to go away and think that's government policy. Deputy Health Minister John Abbott caused a furor last week with comments like this. Do we meet, need as many nurses as we have now? I would say no. An opinion that drew a sharp rebuke from the nurses' union. Our members today are feeling like they've been slapped in the face by this government. Abbott later apologized for any heightened tension he may have caused. Today, Hagee made it clear, John Abbott is just one voice. At the end of the day, it is the elected officials, myself, cabinet, premier and caucus, who will make government policy. But like Abbott, Hagee signaled that change is coming. And he said the political will is there to make it happen. There is a desire around the table in cabinet, within caucus, to figure out <clears throat> how we get from where we are now to where we want to go. And, and the description of where we want to go is actually quite simply summed up, but very difficult to, to sometimes implement, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the right care in the right place at the right time from the right people. Whether he's upset with his deputy minister or not, his message was similar to Abbott's, though he was much less direct on what needs to be done. We have in this province 46% more RNs per capita uh, than 
um, the Canadian national average. We also actually are the second highest in terms of physicians, for example, per capita. Uh, similarly, LPNs were, were around 50% more than the national average. The challenge there is what does that mean? Uh, and how does that tie in to getting the best quality health care we can have? Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, how would you rate snow clearing in your city or town after Saturday's snowfall? A plus, maybe a C. Well, many people in St. John's are giving a failing grade, but the mayor says it wasn't that bad. Here now is Arianna Kelland reports. It's been two days since Mother Nature dumped almost 30 centimeters on St. John's. Two days of this sidewalk on a bus route being covered in thick snow and ice. If you don't have a car, getting around the city can be pretty treacherous. Pedestrians make a choice between dodging traffic or getting a little wet. No sidewalk at all, really. Um, I see cars slow down and kind of swear to the other, the other way to avoid me. It's kind of annoying, honestly. Annoying, but he'll take his chances. Down the road, Judy Taylor did her part to keep the sidewalk clean. Hardly any sidewalk, eh? Must be hard for people walking around, you know, trying to get around. But I guess the uh, once the council crew gets around to it, they'll uh, they'll clear it. I guess it's early yet, you know. Not everyone was as forgiving. Online, the outrage came just as fast as the snow fell. And it wasn't just sidewalks. Drivers were upset at road conditions, too. Deplorable, one woman wrote. Another man mused about trading his Civic for a snowmobile. And this is where Bishop Field students waited for the school bus. If you were to give uh, the city of St. John's a grade on its uh, sidewalk clearing, what would it be? Uh, fail. Not so, according to the mayor. They did a, a great job, I mean, uh, considering what we had. What we had was heavy, wet snow and ice paired with wind. Tricky for snow clearing crews. The sidewalks are messy, but Breen says the work isn't finished yet. This morning, uh, we had the school zones, which is our first priority. Uh, the area of about three to 400 meters in front of every school, we managed to get them cleared out. Now we're beginning on our, on our uh, sidewalk clearing routes. But is it enough? Breen says the city is always looking at ways to be more efficient, like starting shifts earlier in the morning, because no one wants a failing grade. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. And if you live downtown, there is overnight snow removal tonight starting at 12.30 a.m. The full list of streets is available on the City of St. John's website. The on-street parking ban for residents outside of the downtown comes into effect January 7th. The RNC won't be laying any charges against a farmer in Torbay. This picture circulating on social media was taken during Saturday's blizzard, and police say the owner explained that his return home was delayed due to circumstances that were beyond his control, but he took care of the animal once he arrived. Police say the cow was not harmed, and there was no violation of the beef cattle code of practice. The town of Torbay had asked the RNC to investigate the matter as a possible case of animal cruelty. Well, many people on this side of the province have... Uh Sore shoulders and backs, Mr. Germain is one of them, as they spent much of yesterday shoveling. This was the scene that played out in uh, many parts of St. John's on Sunday. People clearing up uh, after the storm uh, uh, from the day before. Now strong winds, and I love this scene. This was uh, uh, right along uh, Craig Miller Avenue. And again, it looks like a beehive uh, with uh, activity. Uh, strong winds, heavy snow, of course, uh, caused Saturday's uh, treacherous driving conditions, power failures, but it was yesterday that was all about the cleanup. And depending on where you live, amounts uh, varied, of course, uh, from uh, snowfall. But at the airport, we did register 29 centimeters officially. Yeah. Okay, I bet you that the uh, people who were out there shoveling wish they could have been shoveling that fast. That's yeah, you know, yeah no kidding. <laughs> Speed it up. Because right. it did take a long time. You were saying oh, it was yeah. like hours. It finds me back. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was heavy, and the snow stuck to the <laughs> shovel. It was really yeah. frustrating. Well, we had that little bit of mixing in there, right, yeah. with the ice pellets and a little bit of drizzle, just enough to make, make it, it St. John cement. What yeah. can you do to keep the snow from sticking because yeah. I had the same problem with the shovel. Somebody Very recommended on Twitter. You spray your shovel with, with Pam. Pam. <laughs> a 
Apparently it works. I have not tried it myself, but apparently it works. Now the storm, of course, also uh, meant bad news uh, for kids and parents in Paradise. The town uh, planned to hold its Christmas parade yesterday, but because of the large amount of snow that fell, uh, combined with the, uh, high winds, uh, council decided to call it down. Um, now, because it's so close to the big day, there is no time to reschedule, mm. unfortunately. No. So bad. Uh, some bad news for some. Right. Now, uh, now, do we want to show you some of the other totals? Uh, Roddy, I think we do have uh, that next, or are we doing fairies next? Okay, let's uh, talk about the, uh, the totals. Now, I talked about 29 centimeters in St. John's. That was the official total at the airport, but we did top out around 32 in Mount Pearl. Pretty similar, though, from areas of Placentia, uh, right up through the metro region. Uh, that uh, total came from Dunville. Even around the Buren Peninsula, uh, totals range from 10 to about 20 to 25 centimeters. Lethbridge around 15 centimeters of snowfall. So we got that one out of the way, but there's always one brewing. And as we take a look at the forecast through tomorrow, it's pretty quiet. In fact, if you have some travel plans, some flurries along the south coast uh, and along the west coast as well, our next system moves in for Tuesday night in through Wednesday. Some accumulating snow, central western parts of Newfoundland, but a mixed rain for most of us, mostly rain for the southeast. But this will be a bigger event for the Straits and up through Labrador. And then it becomes a bigger event for Thursday along the west coast with onshore flurries and snow squalls becoming a big story for Thursday in Western Newfoundland. So we'll talk more about that with your full weather forecast. And I mentioned those ferries, uh, some news there, Anthony. All right, thanks Ryan, I'll handle the ferries. Marine Atlantic is getting closer to eliminating the backlog last week's bad weather cost. Just a few days ago, there were hundreds of trucks and large containers parked outside terminals in Port of Basque and North Sydney. But the company says all that delayed traffic has now been cleared from Port of Basque and significant progress is being made to clear the backlog in North Sydney. There are two crossings scheduled out of Nova Scotia this evening and Marine Atlantic says that should help move the bulk of commercial traffic. The people who run Fortis were filled with the Christmas spirit today. The Energy Corporation announced a $1 million donation toward the construction of the Salvation Army Center of Hope. The $14 million facility is being built in St. John's. Today's announcement was made just outside Fortis headquarters. Company officials were joined by Premier Dwight Ball and City Mayor Danny Breen. The Salvation Army says the $1 million is the biggest corporate donation yet. Center of Hope will provide 20 supportive housing units with a variety of wraparound services, including feeding programs, food distribution, employment training and counseling, emergency disaster services, correction and justice services, addictions counseling. It will provide community health supports as well that will help meet the physical mental, dental, and chiropractic needs of our people, plus a whole range of other supports that will be offered. A million dollars, uh, very, very big, impressive. Tis the season for giving, but often when we say that, most people think it's about a donation for a food bank or maybe a present for a child. Yeah, which are great gifts, but on Saturday in St. John's, a group of healthcare professionals went above and beyond. They teamed up with the Lions Club to give the gift of sight. He's so busy, it, like, it takes months and years sometimes to see this guy. And here he gave up his free time and just to open up his doors and to help the community, which is fantastic. Can you imagine? I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy. He made me so happy. He made all these people so happy. Because all the talk about town is about what he did and what he's doing here today, which is fantastic. Not just him, like I said, like his nurses, his technicians, and the other doctors too as well. What a fantastic way to give back to Christmas, huh? made a difference in my life and it's going to make a difference in my friend's life now who's in there now getting her free glasses. Complete difference, change of life. So I can see. <laughs> it is really, really nice for people that, you know, can't get it done. i got to say thanks very much for them doing it for everybody, including myself. Well, I've been gone a long time now without the glasses because I couldn't afford it, right? So now... It would be pretty tough, because I'm a senior on a budget like a lot of people. But I'm quite happy with, with this, what they're doing here today. A lot of happy people. Yeah. Anna yeah. Doyle credits Dr. Christopher Jackman and his staff with changing her life. Amazing, eh? So many of us take being able to see for granted. What a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my life now, every, every day goes by, I'm going to have to deal with this. I'm never going to be the same. For the first time, a shooting victim speaks out.
Welcome back. We have a CBC exclusive tonight. For the first time since he was shot four years ago, Charlie LaCosta is speaking publicly about the devastating impact it has had on him. LaCosta is one of Jason Marsh, Marsh's victims. On Friday, Marsh was sentenced to 12 years in prison for shooting LaCosta and another man in St. John's in two separate incidents in 2013. Tonight, Here and Now's Glenn Payette brings you LaCosta's story, but first, a warning. Glenn's report has some disturbing images. Charlie LaCosta no longer walks with the ease he once did. This is a whole leg pretty much tore out and skin graft after and taking bullets out of it. On the evening of November 11th, 2013, Jason Marsh went to LaCosta's home and started firing into it with a laser sighted 22 caliber gun. I took off and he kept shooting, shooting, shooting rounds at me and I took my dog and I went to the back door and I went up to the back of the house. I went back of the shed and laid down until I seen the car pass and I brought myself way back down here and I was bleeding and I picked up the cell phone which I left on the couch and phoned the police. Marsh pleaded guilty to the shooting, but why did he do it? The court heard that it was because LaCosta had given drugs to a girl or because LaCosta had hurt a member of Marsh's family. LaCosta says it wasn't about Marsh getting vengeance. LaCosta says it was a hit, that Marsh was hired by a man whose former girlfriend, LaCosta, had gotten pregnant. Marsh admitted that at the time he was scary and out of control. You think the ex, yes. the ex boyfriend, put yeah. Marsh up to yes. this? Yes, yes, yeah. Do you think he was trying to kill you? Yes, I do. Marsh was originally charged with attempted murder. How do you feel uh, about that charge being dropped? It kind of made me disgusted because of the system. Um, you know, I got to deal with this every day. I will, every day of my life now, every every day goes by, I'm gonna have to deal with this. I'm never gonna be the same. Not the same because he wasn't just shot in the leg. The puncture's there, but look like punctures. Are those the bullet, are those bullet holes? Bullet holes, yeah. And the scarring is, I guess, that's an yeah. operation? Yeah. Bullets sliced into his liver and tore into his bowel. I had a bag on my side. Colostomy? Colostomy bag. I had many feet of that removed. Your, your bowel? Yes, I had bag on for almost a year or something like that. He was told he would likely never walk again, but he beat those odds. Emotionally, he's somewhat stronger, but in the beginning, he was a wreck. Did you want to testify? Did you want to tell I, your story? Actually, for no, I didn't because at the time, it's just now coming around because it's been that long. It's just to even talk to you guys. You know, I didn't want to be down in the courtrooms and I didn't want to be down there because I just tried to forget about it, but it's so hard too. In court, Marsh apologized for shooting LaCosta. Apologies is it, it's not really much the apology is going to do for me to say you're sorry because, you know, you wouldn't do that to a dog. What would you like to say to Marsh? There's not really much that you would want to say to a person that, that tried to kill you over nothing. LaCosta had to give up his old dog, a Newfoundlander, because he couldn't look after him. Now he has a new dog, Chevy, a pit bull for protection. And as if LaCosta needs it, a bullet hole in the house is a reminder of what happened. He used to work in construction, but it seems those days are gone. Charlie, when you look at your injuries, how does it make you feel? Angry, sad, pressing, press, everything. Glenn Payette, CBC News. St. John's. What was lighting up the sky during this weekend's blizzard? Thunder snow? Transformers? Ryan's best guess is coming up.
Gone are the days of lost on the way. Buddy What's His Name and the other fellers are hitting the road for their final big tour. On Boxing Day, the tour is coming to your television. You couldn't have Santa Claus without the elves. Oh. It's the same thing, right? Okay. You can't have Buddy What's His Name and the other fellers without the road, you know? Yeah. The tour, the band, the history, the fans, see it all in still some more to go. 6 p.m. on December 26th, everywhere in Atlantic Canada. All right, some uh, interesting pictures, to say the least, sent to us by Cassandra Barry Photography. This was a wedding on Saturday during that stormy day, Allison Hill and Adam Fian's blizzard wedding. Just get a load of this next shot. There they are on the steps of St. Patrick's Church in downtown St. John's. But you know, they look, they look happy. fabulous. Uh, they'll have a wedding story to it's talk amazing. about. It's actually quite beautiful. Yeah, and I was at that wedding. Mm -hmm. I had uh, the privilege of being there. The uh, the ladies had to have their hair touched up, I can tell you that. Uh, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. It was gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Like you said, a great story yeah. for, uh, for years and years to come. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, uh, speaking of that very storm, you know, on Saturday night, I don't know if you saw any flashes in the sky. Uh, a lot of people were mentioning on Twitter, oh, I Actually, think there yeah. might be lightning. Yeah. And while I can't rule out thunder snow, I think the better possibility is what you call power arcing. And that is where we have, Whoa. of course, those strong winds and the power lines get swaying back and forth. And when they touch, you see oh. an arc like this. And if it's snowing, you can imagine how that would light up the sky yeah. even a little bit more. Yeah. And so, so it would be a glow through all the snow. Exactly. Right? So, uh, and actually Newfoundland Power tweeted out the, uh, the they're pretty sure this was uh, the culprit as well. Hmm. It's got the no, frying sound that. that goes with it too, Exactly, right? exactly, which would also be amplified as it hit all that uh, snow and the water right. in the air. So, uh, there you go. Arcing. Thanks. So from that storm yep. to the next system, which uh -oh. uh, may, well, I think it will prompt some warnings. Uh, why don't we start uh, with our special weather statements that are in effect across, uh, well, the west coast of the island and also southeastern parts of Labrador. A lot of weather coming with this one. Here is the Coles notes. And again, this is for Tuesday night, Wednesday into Thursday. The Avalon, the Bure and Bonavista, mostly rain. I don't think it's going to be significant rain, but... Rain on the way nonetheless and a bit of a warm up. Now for central parts of Newfoundland back towards Corner Brook, this is going to be about 5 to 10 centimeters by the looks of things. Some rain and drizzle, but again, not significant. Where I think we'll see significant rain is along that southwest coast. Uh, Burgio Highway inland areas could see some significant snow due to some upsloping there. And significant snow 10 to 20 centimeters or more in the 20 centimeter plus possibilities are mainly for Labrador. Uh, looking at, uh, again, significant snow there. Lighter snow in Lab West and up towards the North Coast. Snow squalls Thursday are going to become a big story for the West Coast. Some very gusty winds coming in on the other side of the system. And yes, the possibility for some significant snowfall accumulation there as well. Backing things out, a week low south of Nova Scotia really won't have much of an impact. It'll throw a few flurries into the mix tomorrow, but this is the weather system that is on the way well to our west, but it will clip in at a pretty good pace over the next 24 to 48 hours. Tomorrow morning, note the flurry chances, mainly for the west coast and along the south coast. I think we'll see a little bit in the way of sun possibilities for central uh, and especially Labrador. St. John's and the Avalon may see a few sunny breaks as well. Pretty cool start once again for tomorrow. Uh, looking at overnight lows generally near minus 7, minus 15 for inland areas of uh, Newfoundland and minus 20 in western Labrador. Winds will be light there again. Can't rule out a flurry now. Watch as we roll throughout the day tomorrow. A southerly flow. So temperatures will actually be on the plus side. A flurry may mix with a drizzle, a period of drizzle on that south coast. Good chance of flurries through the day along the west coast, and then the system will roll in Tuesday night. We'll show you that in a sec, but first, here are your uh, temperatures for tomorrow again. Certainly on the rise as uh, winds will shift to the south, uh, a lot warmer than today. In Labrador, temperatures ranging from minus 3 in the Straits to minus 15 in the west. Okay, so watch your timeline here. Tuesday night, 
there's that possibility for some significant snow for inland areas of the southwest with rain at times heavy along the south coast and that snow tracking into Labrador by Wednesday morning as well. Uh, that mixed rain for the southeastern half of the island with, yeah, again, some rain in the mix. Again, as I mentioned, I don't think it'll be significant rain, but certainly with those winds plus the rain plus the warmer temperatures, some snow eating weather on the way here. Northern Peninsula, Labrador again, mostly snow, and that's where we have that possibility of picking up more than 10 centimeters there. There are your temperatures on the plus side, as warm as four uh, for the Buren and the Avalon Peninsulas just above the freezing mark uh, for Cornerbrook and the West Coast. And we'll talk more about uh, that uh, possibility for those snow squalls and looking very likely, in fact, for Thursday. Plus, tonight we begin the top weather stories of 2017. We'll look at uh, the first installment tonight uh, coming up in a few minutes. Debbie? The latest on Delilah Saunders' liver condition. That's next. The Lilo Saunders family is holding out hope the Inuk activist from Labrador will be granted a liver transplant if necessary. The 26-year-old is in critical condition in a Toronto hospital after being transferred there last week. Delilah has been denied a spot on Ontario's transplant waiting list because she hasn't been sober the required six months. But her family says it was Tylenol use that damaged Delilah's liver, and her alcohol relapse was a result of not receiving support during the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women. Delilah Saunders became an advocate after her sister, Loretta, was murdered in Halifax in 2014. She was often the spokesperson for the family and appeared at the National Inquiry in October. It's because of that work that Amnesty International gave Delilah its highest honour this year. And her parents, Miriam and Clayton Saunders and lawyer Karima Saad, join us now. Thank you very much for being here. I want to start with you, Ms. Saad. Uh, what is the latest on Delilah's condition? Uh, so, as of right now, we're cautiously optimistic that we've seen some improvements. Uh, we're still not out of the woods yet, and we're waiting on more feedback from doctors to determine what the next steps must be. Well, that must be somewhat optimistic for you, Mrs. Saunder, that uh, there is some improvement. Improvement, But I, I want you to tell us, how did Le Delilah get to the point 
where her liver failed and she is in such serious condition. She had uh, uh, problems with her wisdom teeth and they were pain and then they got infected so she was taking Tylenol for her pain and she kept taking the Tylenol and then she started getting stomach pain and then she started taking the Tylenol for her stomach. She had called me crying with pain and that she had been taking Tylenol. And I understand that Tylenol will damage livers of people who abuse alcohol, which she has admitted to doing. Not necessarily with only people who abuse alcohol. In fact, I was talking to a preacher friend. His brother never ever drank and he also had come across, not so severe, but he did come across. He did get Tylenol poisoning and he had never ever put a beer to his to his mouth. Now, is she aware of the debate surrounding her condition? Some say she should have to follow the rules and wait for six months. Others say, no, this is not necessary. Is she aware of all this controversy? Yes, yeah, she came up, became aware of it last night because she, she saw it on, she was able to get on her phone and see some comments and stuff on, on Facebook. And last night she had a really bad night because she realized what she had done, like she had, what was situation she was in, that she, her liver was gone and she was, it was possible that she would die. So yes, she hadn't slept last night because she was upset. Many have come forward, offered to be a liver donor for Delilah and Amnesty International. It's thrown its support behind her. Can you tell us just the extent of this outpouring? Yeah, people have, um, in the immediate family and extended family, um, certainly have come forward. And I understand that there have been others as well who have been touched by the story and um, want to see the right thing done and wish to be a part of that. This so in any we wouldn't be relying on um, a donor, um, no, like I an anonymous donor, so to speak. It would be a living donation. Yes, I, me, myself, offered, and my, my children. It's not like we wanted, we were seeking a donor outside the family and friends. And I feel like it was, it, it's unfair that anybody should have to undergo this, being denied a liver. I mean, the government, the government, they sell the beer. They don't, you know, they sell it. So, and they make billions of it. So I feel that by they shouldn't sell it. They shouldn't even sell the Tylenol. And and like I said, it was at the time they told me she had Tylenol poisoning. The kidney specialist said Tylenol poisoning. He never mentioned anything by his testing. He didn't mention anything about alcohol. Mrs. Saunders, uh, that this was a difficult time from what you're saying for Delilah. This must be a very difficult time for you, given what you've been through over the last few years. Yes, it has, both for me and my husband and the family. But uh, with, with the help of God, I said, I, I, it's with God's help that he's the one giving us the comfort and, the, you know, without him, we wouldn't make it, I wouldn't make it for sure. We plan to continue with it for other people because Delilah is not because she's in it, we're fighting for this, we're fighting for this for all the people in Canada because this is a Canadian legislation that's preventing her from having liver transplant if she needs it. Mrs. Saunders, Mr. Saunders and uh, Ms. Saad, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Another wild year in weather, the first of Brian's top 2017 weather makers. Next.
Let's introduce you now to this young man, nine-year-old James Hurley of Mount Norai. He's our young athlete of the day. James has been practicing gymnastics since he was four. He was recently highlighted by Gymnastics NL as a rising star in the sport. He trains at uh, Salto's Gymnastics Club in Corner Brook, and he's looking forward to another season where he will be competing in the men's level two. Way to go, James. You're today's young athlete of the day. All right, so all of this week, we're going to be looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly of the past year in NL weather. And tonight, we look back to last winter. Yeah, I remember two years ago, it was really disappointing for the snow lovers, but yeah. things are different. Yeah, not so much last year, though. <laughs> yeah, lots of shovels uh, on the go, lots of uh, driveways to snow blow. That's why uh, one of the top stories over the past year is the winter that was biting back. This past winter was one that kicked off with numerous storms and lots of snow for both Newfoundland and Labrador through December. Hopefully it's better than this. Hopefully we can get the brunt of it first. While we had a few breaks in the action, there were plenty of storms and lots of shoveling to do right across the province through January as well. What are you thinking on a day like today? I can't stand it. I've got no time for snow. <laughs> no time whatsoever. Well, maybe that's why you helped get rid of it, hey? You diesel. Yeah. <laughs> Old man winter really kicked into high gear in February. That's when we experienced record-breaking minus 58 wind chills in Wabush. And of course, that monster two-day blizzard, which hit eastern and central Newfoundland just in time for Valentine's Day, dropping anywhere from 30 to 70 centimeters of snow. Broad Stander wants to play Broad Stander, I think. And of course, the winter storms kept coming through March with our fair share of snow and ice. Leaning into one of the worst springs, in recent memory, but that's a story for tomorrow. <laughs> well, you just bring joy and mirth wherever you go. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, <laughs> it's a nice little uh, warm up and yeah. reminder that we're just getting started. So, I it must be survival mode for me, but I don't remember all the weather. Like I don't remember the horrible spring. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, Locked it out. That's right. Ted yeah. Blade said the same thing when I was uh, talking about this uh, today on uh, CBC Radio. He said he does not remember at all. I, I remember everything. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's cataloged in there somewhere. But uh, anyway, that's why I like to bring these uh, stories because a lot of people have forgotten. And of course, tomorrow, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, the windstorm and then, uh, of course, spring. So there's lots to talk about Some over doozies. the next couple of days. I remember the yeah. windstorm, though. Yeah. Uh, okay, so current weather now and the weather on the way headlines and there's lots to talk about in the next couple of days and we're going to be talking all the way up to Christmas, of course, with the seven day outlook. So uh, more warm air coming and everybody wondering, are we going to be able to hang on to the snow in eastern parts of Newfoundland, which of course just got 30 centimeters. Well, uh, certainly that snow is going to take a hit. I don't think it's going to be around for everybody as some areas will definitely have some, I think, grass at least mixing through. Uh, this is the one system that's going to bring some of that rain. And again, this is kind of your headlines over the next uh, couple of days, Wednesday into Thursday. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. The areas in blue with the significant snow, central western Newfoundland, we'll see that mix from snow to rain and drizzle, mostly rain in the east. And uh, the snow squalls for Thursday. If you do have travel plans along the west coast, Wednesday night into Thursday, looks like things will turn quite unsettled and stormy there. Here's how things will play out. Note those flurries along the west and south coast tonight. As we roll into tomorrow, more of the same with uh, the steadier precip moving in for Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. This is where we'll see that accumulating snow for central parts of Newfoundland. Again, the Buren and the Avalon, it's a pretty quick mix to rain. Wednesday afternoon, the snow really starts to ramp up in Labrador along with those winds, the northern peninsula into the mix as well. And there is again Wednesday night into Thursday around this low, the onshore squalls and flurries. And some of those squalls will also reach the Buren Peninsula and across the south coast as well. This will be a pretty good solid system with uh, lots of wind and snow again for the coast of Labrador, uh, mainly south of McCovic, but even Nain and Hopedale will likely see some wind and some uh, accumulation here. By the time we get to Friday, if you have some travel plans, uh, taking uh, things early, uh, things not looking too bad. Now Saturday, of course, Tibbs Eve looks also quiet 
through the afternoon. Our next system will approach through that Saturday evening time period. By the time we get to Sunday afternoon, it looks like we will see some rain across. Uh, again, the timing of this will obviously be key and we're still a few days out, but the general theme here is the system does move in through Christmas Eve day with rain in the east and some snow tracking through Labrador and then a bit of a break. And if you do have some travel plans on Christmas Day, it looks like we'll see a break between the two systems. One Christmas Eve, the next one looking set to roll in through Boxing Day. So uh, here is the seven day outlook. Of course, I will keep you posted on this all week long. But uh, again, Santa, of course, moves in on Christmas Eve. That's why he's there. And then, of course, Christmas Day with the bells on Monday. And so there is your uh, travel forecast, which again, some pretty solid travel days uh, for uh, the Friday into Saturday time period, although those squalls are winding down in western parts of Newfoundland and into Labrador. Again, looking at a pretty solid stretch here uh, beyond the Wednesday, Thursday time period. Friday, Saturday looks okay, but watching uh, that uh, system coming in for Christmas Eve. Well, there's a potential fire hazard in your home you may not be aware of. It's your clothes dryer. As one Halifax homeowner learned, cleaning the lint trap regularly is only the start of what you need to do to make it safe. Yvonne Colbert reports. If I wouldn't have caught it when I did, I'm pretty sure the house would have burnt down for sure. Thankfully for Halifax resident Ryan Stevens, the only thing destroyed was the dryer. Stephen says he cleaned the lint trap after every use and even cleaned his dryer vent, so he was shocked to learn what actually caused the fire. Didn't realize that there was a gigantic amount of lint that was actually inside the dryer itself. The fire department opened it up for me to show me and you could see that there was a massive amount of lint in there. That comes as no surprise to David Longley of Appliance Maritimes. Well, the worst that I've seen are four, five, six inches of lint covering the whole bottom of the dryer. And that's normally because you've got a, a clogged vent. The dryer's gotten pushed back against the wall too tight and has kinked off your dryer vent. Um, so now all that lint and everything of hot air is backing up into your dryer. So there'll be a little bit of moisture, so of course the lint's going to attract to it and it just builds up over time. Longley says if lint gets around thermostats, motors, or heating elements inside the dryer, it can ignite. Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency answer an average of 10 dryer fire calls every year, resulting in everything from minor damage to complete loss of homes. They say there are telltale signs to watch for. If you notice any uh, uh, decrease in performance or it's getting too hot or it's not hot enough, that's probably an indication that you have a problem down the line. Another important consideration is the kind of vent on your dryer. The fire service set up a demonstration showing how quickly the various types of vents with lint inside can ignite. The plastic one is not designed for use in a dryer. So not only uh, does it burn very quickly, but uh, it, it, it exposes the fire to everything that's around it. It took less than a minute for the white plastic vent to be destroyed. The fire service says the light aluminum is not the best choice, although it's better than the plastic. It took longer to completely burn. It recommends a heavier aluminum vent for dryers. That took much longer to ignite. Yvonne Colbert, CBC News, Halifax. City officials in Halifax issued a public apology today to female firefighters. It follows a 12-year battle by a former firefighter who complained about abusive and demeaning behavior on the job. The CBC's Shana Luck has the details. Firefighter Leanne Tessier got a historic apology from the city of Halifax's fire service today. Leanne Tessier told reporters that she faced gender discrimination at work, including having vicious rumors spread about her and having her gear tampered with. And while Leanne Tessier said it is long past time for this apology to happen, she continued to encourage women to join the fire service and to speak out about discrimination. And for fire departments across the country, if you care about women in the fire service like they claim they do, do the right thing and acknowledge the obvious gender discrimination that is happening to women so they can speak out and feel safe. She says that in the past few days she has been overwhelmed with calls from other women across North America saying that they experienced the same thing. Now for his part, Fire Chief Ken Steubing acknowledged historic gender discrimination within his force. I extend an apology on behalf of the Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency to Leanne Tessier 
one of our former volunteer firefighters, and any other female firefighter who has experienced discrimination within this organization. He said that he has taken some steps to combat that, including appointing a conflict resolution specialist. He did note that the people that Tessier specifically complained about in her complaint have not faced discipline. I'm not aware of individual instances that have happened. I am aware some of those leaders uh, that have been talked about in the past uh, have retired. Uh, the terms of the settlement are about acknowledging the systemic discrimination that we're committed to addressing moving forward. Tessier is no longer with the fire service, but she said she will be watching to make sure that these equity measures are properly rolled out. Her message to women, continue to speak out, even though it may be hard. Shana Luck, CBC News, Halifax. On the U.S. West Coast has killed several people and injured dozens of others. The exact number of fatalities is not yet known, but officials are calling it a mass casualty event. 501, emergency, we are on the ground. We need EMS ASAP. That was the train's engineer radioing for help. The derailment occurred about 65 kilometers south of Seattle in Pierce County, Washington. The train was entering a curve and crossing a bridge over a major highway when it went off the rails during the morning rush hour. Several of the rail cars tumbled onto the road below. We know that we have multiple um, fatals uh, in the train, no fatals on the roadway. As you can see by the large response, we've extricated the fire departments, have many people and have taken them out of the train and they've been transported to hospital. There's damage to the bridge, there's damage to multiple vehicles down below damage to the ground around it, so I-5 southbound will probably be closed for quite some time. Interstate 5 is the main highway along the U.S. West Coast, stretching from Canada all the way down to Mexico. The train was traveling southbound from Seattle to Portland on what was touted as the train's inaugural run for higher speed service. 77 passengers and five crew are on board. A state of emergency has been declared in Washington State. Well, as we look back at some of the top weather stories <laughs> of the year, we're also looking back at some of the top weather pictures of the year. And this is one of my picks. Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly a memorable one from Gander in April. Uh, we'll show you uh, Debbie and Anthony's picks <laughs> after the break.
Welcome back. Well, it's a celebration fit for the North Pole. But believe it or not, this is actually Nice in France and brave revelers took part in an annual polar dip event in the Bay of Angels or Angel, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but 200 people took part in the swim, many decked out, as you can tell, in some festive Santa finery. Well, it looks kind of cool, but there's no ice there <laughs> anyway. So um, the temperature, though, was a chilly 14 degrees Celsius. The holiday bath is a tradition which started about 50 years ago. They looked none the worse for wear, nope, did they? <laughs> they seem to be, oh my goodness. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Turning now to a woman who calls herself the MacGyver of millinery. A milliner, of course, is uh, someone who makes hats. Right, I'd forgotten what that was. She turns <laughs> wire, nylon, fabric, and felt into some fascinating creations fit for a royal wedding. I am currently making um, festive fascinators, which are um, little hair pieces. Uh, I like to call them high fashion for your hair. They're a good alternative to a hat. I uh, probably started really seriously making them and sort of learning about the history of millinery, which is what this kind of um, hat making is called. Uh, when I was about 12 or 13, um, I read as much as I could about it and sort of found a way to figure out how to do it on my own without the training, per se. For the past seven years, I have been a burlesque performer in St. John's. Um, I am also a burlesque producer. Uh, here at Kitty Kitty Productions is my production company, and we do nerd culture and sort of themed shows. And I also teach burlesque uh, with my school of burlesque. It's St. John's Burlesque Academy. So uh, the fascinators and the hair pieces kind of tie into that. It's a huge part of like the stage sort of ideal. I also do uh, pinup modeling as well, so it really ties in with that, the kind of uh, retro rock Billy look. And that's a nice fascinator yeah, for the yeah. Christmas season. They're mm -hmm. all in style these days. You could, pu you could pull that off. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I will. <laughs> I thought you were talking about me. Uh, well, <laughs> if I had that Santa, that uh, Christmas suit on, maybe. Uh, so. oh, oh, that gives me an idea. <laughs> oh, never give Debbie an idea. Uh, now, we, before the break, we were talking about uh, the top pictures of the year. Now, yep. what I did, I went back through social media, my Facebook feed, my Twitter feed. I grabbed basically the top 50 liked and shared photos of the year. Uh, and uh, so they're basically your pictures, but Debbie and An Anthony and I are going to share our favorites of those this week. This was mine from Gander in March or April. Uh, this one was Anthony's selection. Beautiful. It's hard not to like that. There are, there's so many good yeah. ones, right? It's hard to choose, but yeah. um, fantastic stuff. There were, like you said, so many to choose yeah. from. I, um, I liked most all of them. That's right. That was, of course, the famous Fairyland Iceberg, and this was Debbie's picture. Nice. Yeah. I could picture myself in that kayak. That's what spoke to me. And when I looked closely, there was the rabbit. That's right. There's a rabbit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was taken at Easter time, so this one went viral for sure. Uh, thanks to Barb for that one. Uh, by the way, those top 50 pictures will all be revealed uh, January 1st at cbc.ca. Excellent. We have just enough time to say goodnight. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye.